Show today, the number one pound for pound bare knuckle fighter on the planet. Numerous weights. Here he is, Louis Baboon Palomino. What's happening, mate? You good? What's good, mate? How you doing, man? Doing great, doing great. Thank God. I'm really good, mate. Thanks. How's life been? Been great, man. Can't complain. Can't complain, brother. <laughs> Good, good, mate. I was wondering if we could start this podcast, mate, just by going back to the beginning. And um, when you left, like, obviously MMA and you got the offer to turn over to Bare Knuckle, how did it feel getting that offer? I mean, it was great, man. What, what was going on back then, back then, I would say the face of the organization was Jim Allers, which was a former teammate of mine. We trained yeah. for the past. He's a former UFC fighter, and um, he was doing great, man. He was, like, on a three-fight win streak finishing everybody in the first round. I was like, hmm, so this looks like it's more suited for me, you know, like this is my style, you know? And uh, I had retired from MMA due to injuries. Like I had a uh, MCL tear, uh, PCL tear on the same knee, a bad toe that like, it's like chronic pain from like, um, stage three arthritis like you know stuff that i couldn't if i take off the boxing shoes or the wrestling shoes i was worthless you know i was fighting in russia fighting the russians in russia losing split decisions or or robbed decisions to be better to be more technical about it um due to not being able to like utilize my wrestling or kicking so i was fighting very limited you know and uh I had for the first time ever lost four fights in a row and I was in a just depression zone. Um, things were just not going right, man. You know, like if you asked me back then, you know, how's life going? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was the opposite of, of today. And it was, uh, it was just a real fast and hard downward spiral, you know? And yeah. finally I see Jim Allen's doing his thing. I see like, man, this is, this is dope. You, you mean to tell me that I can trade punches and I don't got to worry about nobody taking me down or nobody trying to, like, wrestle with me and grapple with me. Like, man, sign me up. And then I heard that Dave Felmer was in town. And, you know, I followed the page. I'm already I'm already into it. I'm following it. Everybody would tell him, you know, you got to sign Palomino. You got to sign Baboon. You got to sign Palomino. And, and he finally gave me an opportunity to speak to him. And I spoke to him, you know, one-on-one uh, -on -one in person. And we started off right off the back. You know, we said, hey, you know, uh, we talked about Jim Allers and the possibility of fighting him later on, you know, us being friends and old teammates. I said, look, man, business is business. You know what I mean? Like, uh, we have a friendship that was not even a friendship like Tyler Goodjohn today. I have a good friendship with Tyler Goodjohn because we actually see each other, like, on a daily basis. You know, we actually go out, do something. Like, Jim Allers was, like, a training partner and a friend because it was a cordial friendship, but we didn't, like, hang out and go and have a drink or watch fights together. You know, we, we didn't have that type of relationship either. And so, hey, look, man, this, this is business. You know what I mean? Um, so then it was about the tournament. It was a three-fight tournament to get into the, to get into, to get, to become the first uh, lightweight champion. Yeah. And the only thing that we agreed upon was uh, that if we were going to fight each other, we were going to fight each other in the end of the tournament. And something like that happened, you know, <laughs> with the whole, it was your fight, fight one, wasn't it? Brie or then that other kid, and then it was Alos, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, Brito was my debut, my debut, and then um, Brito, to be technically speaking about it, Brito wasn't part of the tournament. Brito was my debut fight, yeah, um, beat him five to zero. Like, literally, Brito landed one jab that yeah. I wrecked in the entire fight, five rounds. Uh, you know, my first fight, I'm trying to like. You know, see things. You know, I'm just I'm gonna just outbox this guy. You know, yeah. And then COVID starts, but then they start. No, then the tournament starts, and the first fight. Who was it? Isaac Body Flag. I said, yes, yes, yes. And um, Isaac Body Flag. He was four and zero back then, and it was the the reason why you know the whole tournament fell apart. You know what I mean? No, it's just yeah. a. So, yes, Brito was the first fight in the tournament. That's correct. Yes. Brito yeah, was the first <laughs> tournament, yes. And then the tournament dismantled because of COVID. And then because it dismantled, they said, well, you're going to go straight to, to fight Jim Allers for the belt. Yeah. Okay, sign me up. Let's do it. You know, and then Jim Allers backed out. He didn't want to fight without his trainer being present. His trainer had COVID and whatnot. 
or they weren't training. I don't know what happened. And he chose not to take the fight. And I fought Isaac Valley Flag, who had the same record. He was 4-0. Yeah, I said Valley Flag had also fought in UFC, one FC, yeah. like shows. He had just came from winning uh what's his name? Uh heavy hitter from UFC. He had just came from from, from beating this guy, I forgot his name. Yeah. Melvin Gillard. Melvin Gillard, he had just came from beating that was just a big win, if you ask me, you know. Yeah. I was supposed to fight Melvin Gillard in World Series of Fighting, WSOF, which is now called PFL. Fight never happened, but and then I was supposed to fight him somewhere else and it never happened. So I was a fight that I was looking forward to do, but uh, he did it. He beat him, and he finished him, you know, and uh, that made it enough for me to take him very serious, you know. Yeah. But we came into the fight, and we took him out in, what, 48 seconds first round. <laughs> <laughs> Class. Because uh, you never started out as MMA, did you? You started off fist only boxing at the age of 11. Is that right? Uh, age of... Yes, age of 11, 10, turning 11, I started boxing in California. And I only boxed, like, boxing, boxing with boxing coach, I only boxed for three years. So 11, almost turning 14, yeah. uh, uh, my father goes to prison, and my mom has to move and leave, you know, California, leave everything behind. And she comes to be the single mom in Miami, here in Miami, with you know the rest of her six kids, right? Her the rest of her five kids, including me, right? And um, it was a hard new start for all of us as a family. But yeah. I couldn't box anymore. There was like the only boxing gym near me was a minimum of an hour in two different buses. And Miami today, compared to Miami 26, 27 years ago, you cannot compare. Miami. Yeah. Six years ago was like gang activity, like you wouldn't believe. Like it was like stabbings and shootings, and just depending on where you were, you lose your life. You know what I mean? And if you didn't, you were in some sort of trouble where you had four, five, six, seven, maybe ten guys jumping you for nothing, yeah. <laughs> for nothing. You know, <laughs> to prove point, to to act tough, and it was something that I was completely against. I was completely against, you know taking advantage of somebody, you know, and I, you know, I just finished boxing three years straight in California. So yeah. to me, a fight of more than one and one was cowardice. You know what I mean? Yeah. So we joined the gang and, and that's why I have a tooth in almost every single knuckle from street fights that I never backed out from. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're being fighting from a, from a young age then? Yeah. Yeah. We can say that. Yeah. Guaranteed. But when you obviously had a few fights in the BKFC and you'd got bare knuckle under your belt, did you find the buzz different to MMA? Because I speak to some fighters and they say it's not much different. I feel the same before going in an MMA fight than I do bare knuckle. Did you find it different? Man, to, to answer your question correctly, yes, I, I, I found a difference. And I, and I found a difference to my advantage, number one, you know, yeah. for the fact that in every MMA fight that I got in, I had a black belt jiu-jitsu from a legit black belt and black belt judo, black belt jiu-jitsu, uh, you know, master. You know what I mean? Since yeah. it's early, you know, world's champion in judo and jiu-jitsu. Like, I'm a legit black belt. You know, I can submit people. You know what I mean? But if I took you down, I wanted to punch a hole through your head. That was just my personality. <laughs> I, re I, I literally remember doing a fight uh, with a guy for my second title. It was a CFA show. And I was fighting uh, 145 pounds, and I fought this guy, and I beat this dude's ass for five rounds. I didn't want to finish him. I was having so much fun, I didn't want to finish him. Not to say that it was an easy fight, he was bringing it to me, but I felt in complete control of the fight. And I had just became a black belt, you know, like a, a few weeks prior. Yeah. And like my trainer in the corner of the of the cage, you know, in my corner, when I'm beating this guy's ass, and I'm like. I put the guy in an arm bar just like you know to gift him, you know, <laughs> a thank you for for the teachings. But yeah. I, I had very underrated, very unused jujitsu level um, that I never really utilized because I wanted to punch holes through people's heads, man. It's just part of my personality and what I what I longed for. So so when I come to bare knuckles, like it's a gift. You know what I mean, it's a gift maybe like I can just focus on punching. Which is what I wanted to do. I wanted to trade punches with everybody, you know. So, yeah, yeah. 
And obviously, you beat everybody in the BKFC who you fought, eight and all now. Did you ever picture yourself being the number one pound for pound champion in the world in bare knuckle when you first had your first fight? Man, what, to be very honest with you and to be, you know, very humbly honest, I didn't think that I would become the pound for pound best fighter, best bare knuckle boxer in the world. I, I didn't, I didn't see that far, but I did believe that I would be the champion. I believe yeah. that. I can be a champion. And the mentality that I came into this game was different than MMA. In MMA, I had no knowledge of wrestling, jiu-jitsu. Like, I did jiu-jitsu eight months and I started fighting pro. Like, I didn't do no amateur fights. I didn't know what weight cutting was. I didn't have sparring partners for my first 10 fights. I didn't have no sparring partners, no wrestling coach, and no strength and conditioning coach for my first 10 pro fights fighting at 170 pounds, weighing 165 pounds, because I had no idea that people cut weight to fight. I didn't have no amateur fights. So I, I literally started out, like, against everything, against all odds, you know? So the mentality was, you know, I'm just taking, I'm, I'm, like, I tell my wife sometimes, you know, we, we talk about, you know, business, you know, future things that we're doing, working on, and we're like, we just got to roll the punches, you know what I mean? Because that's what I'm used to doing, you know? So I literally <laughs> rolled with the punches. You know, now the mentality changes because the maturity level, of course, you know, you're a more mature athlete now in that. I thanks to both my conditioning trainers. I, the very first one I started training was Marcos and Marcos was a big part of me starting to turn more into an athlete. And the biggest thing I have to give to Amner Pareda, which is my strength and condition, my strength and um, conditioning coach for the last seven years. Um, and he's like literally turned me into an athlete before yeah. I'm a fighter now i'm an athlete that can yeah. fight you know what i mean so there's a big difference in the both there's a big misconception in fighters that are not mature enough to understand the legitimacy of the level of work that you know it implicates for a professional to become a champion to become a number one how you have to you know adapt and you know you have to adapt and overcome to, to different things, you know what I mean? Like, you have to come out of your comfort zone and make yourself uncomfortable enough to learn new things every day. If not, you just, you're, you're not improving. You're not gonna be the number one. You can't be number one if you're not improving something. And and Amra Pareda turned me into an athlete. The dude, like I was having all these knee issues, like I told you, right? I had like this torn yeah. leg and my toe and this and that, and I'm here full of pains. And Amra's like, man, you don't just have to run to condition, you know? You know yeah. he, he started making me do spinning. He started making me do bike with him. He started taking me to swim in the pool. I'm not going to lie to you. The dude almost tried to fucking drown me in the, in the beach. <laughs> you know, like, you know they we're doing open water. Here I go. It's my first time ever doing open water. And, and I'm, and, you know, okay, so you're going to just go to the buoy over there. You know, the buoy is like 100 meters. You know, go to the buoy and, and go around there and come back. You know, and, and, and he goes ahead of me, you know. No, he tells me to go ahead of him. So I start going, I saw a boat when we first started, I saw a boat like way out there, you know? And I start swimming and I'm like, man, I feel like I've been swimming for too long. Straight, I was swimming like sideways. So I never saw the damn buoy, right? And next thing you know, I had to swim like 300 yards or something. I, I don't know, I, it was far, you know? <laughs> and I'm walking, I'm starting to get tired. And I just stop for a second, I look up and I'm like right next to this boat that I was looking at. So when I look back, I'm like, my wife is just chilling over there nonchalant on the, on, on the sand. This dude is is, is, is is coming back on his second turn looking for me. And I'm just like lost in the middle of the, you know, in, in the beach. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, fuck, so now I got to get back. So now I'm going back. So yeah, I nearly damn drowned that day. But, you know, it made me a better athlete in the sense that, you know, everything that I do, I I I know my numbers for everything. I know how much time I can run a certain amount of, uh, of distance. I know yeah. how much time... I can run a certain amount of miles, kilometers for you guys, and uh, where my heart rate will go at highest, where it will go as lowest, how long it will take my, my heart rate to go. Like, do these things that, you know, are part of an athlete's journey, I yeah. learned to him, you know what I mean? So, you know, that's the difference. So when you come into the, now coming to Bare Knuckle with all of this new, you know, tools in the box, it's like, when I came to Bare Knuckle, I said, I'm going to be undefeated. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come into this game and I'm going to win every fight. I didn't think I would be pound for pound. You know, I didn't think that I would be the best of all boxers in all weight classes, you know? 
uh, bare knuckle boxers. I, I but I did believe I would be an undefeated champion. I believe that, and I set that out in my head, and I've only proved it. You know, mm -hmm. and then the gift came to being recognized by the organization to be the number one pound for pound bare knuckle boxer in the world. You know. Yeah, because a lot of people who come over to the BKFC with big MMA backgrounds like yourself, they have like a fight here and there, like a little payday fight. They don't really go through the rankings and try and go for the belt where you've done it the proper way. You've fought everybody, haven't you? You've fought your way to the belts. You've defended them. Yes. And obviously two weights. So you've absolutely smashed it, really. Yes, man. I mean, uh, there was talk about in, in a lot of back and forth even from, from the juggernaut himself, Lorenzo Hunt being the, the other two-way division champion, right? <laughs> and the dude, you know, the, the dude between both of us, it, I, we have respect for each other. We see each other and we're cool. Yeah. But on social media, he gets funny, you know, and I don't know if it's like the crowd gets behind him and, and he gets riled up and starts talking and typing. <laughs> and there was like a big battle in between both of us where like he wanted to be the pound for pound and he calls himself the pound for pound, you know, and I'm like, I speak with facts, and if you get insulted for what I'm telling you, that's your fault. That's not my fault. I don't insult nobody. If you get insulted by what I'm saying, that's your problem. You know what I mean? I'm gonna speak with facts, and I stick to the truth. You know, the truth of the matter is, when you come in and compare records, you can call yourself the king of knockouts in bare knuckle because I have a lot of knockouts. You have more knockouts than me. Maybe, maybe you can go that route. But pound for pound, man, for you to start like to be even in a conversation of being a pound for pound fighter, let's talk about who you're fighting. The first four fights that he had all together, even today after they fought him, all those four opponents don't have a single win together. You understand what I'm saying? Almost every fighter, if you look at my record, Every fighter that I fought, apart from, we're not talking about their experience in MMA or boxing or wherever they came from. In the bare knuckle world and in the biggest organization in the world, which is BKFC, the leading organization for bare knuckle, most of the fighters that I fought were undefeated. Whether they were 3 and 0, 4 and 0, they were undefeated fighters. You know what I mean? So it's like, if I get a bunch of tomato cans like you got, then I would have more knockouts because it'd be that much easier. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. But when it comes to talking about pound for pound, I think I legitimately earned it and I deserve it because the only person that I fought that was not defeated, that was not undefeated, was uh, Brito. Had already a loss when when he came when I when I met him in my debut, my debut, and then my very last fight with Tom Shore. But Tom Shore has like ten fights; he's not undefeated. Yeah, and, and then Brito again. So everybody else other than that was undefeated. So. You know what I mean? You tell me. Yeah, there's no argument. Like, I, I wouldn't argue with anybody by saying that you weren't the pound for pound, like, because it's, it's just facts in it. Looking at the uh, record, like, do paper doesn't lie, does it? <laughs> yeah. um, who would you say has been your hardest fight to date? Man, I, I'm always, I'm not, I'm not saying this because you're from the UK. You know, this is just the truth. I've always said it and I'm going to continue saying it. The hardest fight that I would say would be Tyler Goodchild. I'll explain yeah. to you why. I'll explain to you why. You know, it's people some people think, oh, you know, because he's training with him because because I manage him. No, no, no. There's a reason why I manage him. There's a reason why why my, my friend and I we signed him. <laughs> you know what I mean? And and that reason was because when we fought Tyler Goodjohn, here comes this undefeated uh BKB champion. Yeah. Uh, you know, with a 15 and 2 record in pro boxing. Like the dude was no joke. You know, he comes over here. And the, the part where I think I give him the utmost respect is the fact that the dude did 15 days of quarantine by his damn self without a trainer. That yeah. speaks volumes because I'm yeah. a very working person. It's very hard to outwork me. Very hard to outwork. I have some sort of different psych. Like I, I can be stupid where I cannot let you outwork me. You know what I mean? I'm talking about like in the gym. Before we even yeah. get to the fight. And, and uh, so I recognize what it takes for somebody to do what he did. You know, yeah. so 15 days in a country you've never even been on, by yourself, training yourself, you know. And then a dude comes over and it's COVID time. It, it's, it was tough. No no trainers. Like, and then you're facing me and then you, you gave me all five rounds, right? And you got to think about it like this. This is the part where people don't understand you know, how good Tyler really is, 
you know, and yeah. what he's done. He comes from a background of first boxing where you're talking about 10, eight rounds, three minute rounds. And then yeah. he comes from BKB, which was like he was doing seven rounds of three minutes. He does five, five rounds easy, don't he? Oh, you know, you know what I mean? Like the dude, you know, like he can go. So the, the I think the biggest thing which he displayed in his last fight, which is something that he didn't even understand. I told him, bro, you have something that you don't understand that you have. That cardio conditioning that he has, yeah, is his special weapon. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Tyler now admits and realizes what kind of weapon he really has that he really possesses. The gift yeah. is the dude can go. He can go. You can see it in the fight when he fought me. You know, as the later rounds come in, he's turning up more and more and more and more. It's like he's like a as the fight goes on, it gets better. Don't it? He's so truck. The more you burn, the better he comes in. You know. And he was the only one that cut me back then. Nobody was touching me. Nobody was touching me. I, got, I come into the fight like this, and I get out of the fight like this. And if I had anything, it was like a headbutt or something. Like in the last fight, I had a headbutt from my last opponent. And you can see it clearly in the video of the fight, third round, he headbutt me. It, and and if, if I get a little cut, it'd be like a little little thing. Like he was the only one that legitimately opened me, caught me, because he yeah. was like, I'm hitting this dude. Man, the stats of the fight is 173 punches to the face, bare knuckle. Yeah. 173 punches to the face I landed. He landed 22. And yeah. beating on his chest, walking forward. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, come on, bro. That's that's like the epitome of a bare knuckle boxer, you know, a Viking for real, you know. And I I, I I talked to my to my biggest sponsor, you know, um, a good, very good friend of mine, Ralph Navarro. I said, man, and and they said, man, we gotta sign this dude, you know. And we were talking about opening management company together and all that. And he was like, yeah, we're, we're definitely signing him. So, you know, we signed him, and here we are with him today, you know. But I would say, to answer the question, hardest fight to date is still, still a tiny good job. Yeah. And what's it been like with you being – was it BKFC 10 you coming? Uh, which one? What? When your debut, was that BKFC 10? It was, wasn't it? Man, I'd be lying to you. I'm, I'm really bad with numbers, brother. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah, it must have been good, though. You've been in from the beginning. What's it been like seeing it grow and, like, getting yeah. to the stage where Conor McGregor's coming in the ring and all that? Man, I miss that day, man. It, it, it's been it's been crazy. It's been, it's been awesome, man, uh, just to watch the company grow at the speed that it has. And I always said it. People ask me, you know, why do you think the Bare Knuckles is going to be so big when I talk about Bare Knuckles? I talk about Bare Knuckles with the most biggest most utmost confidence because i'm gonna put it to you very simple you know i come from mma i'm not against mma i love mma you know it was a part of my life that i already lived but yeah. when we're talking to the masses right when you're looking at the masses looking at a fight in a cage and the masses don't understand what jiu-jitsu and wrestling is you know yeah. so i understand some kicking and punching when it lands when it cuts when it knocks you out but they don't understand when a fight in 80% of the fights will go to the ground at some living point, you know? Yeah. So they don't understand when the grappling starts in the wrestling. And if it just so happens to be a wrestler in there that only wants to take you down and it makes the fight kind of boring, we're talking about five, three minute rounds. I mean, three, five minute rounds. Yeah. And if if it's a title fight, it's 25 minutes, you know? Yeah. And day I go watch fights with my wife and we start doing this thing. <laughs> yeah. if you get three decisions in a row you know you're gonna you start to get bored you know what yeah. I mean? it, you know you have those moments i'm not saying that it's boring i'm just saying it has those boring moments <laughs> hey sh you know what i mean yeah. Bare knuckle, when we're talking about the masses it's very simple to understand it's cut 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 go to sleep cut <laughs> cut cut go to sleep there's nothing else it's, it's no i don't he punched him, he punched him, she punched her, she punched her, she got mm -hmm. cut, he got cut, he went and go to sleep. It's simple to understand. There's not a moment, if there's a clinch, there's no two-hand clinch. There's only a one-hand clinch. The other hand has to be active or it's separated. So yeah. it's done by action. And the simple fact that we're only doing five, two-minute rounds, it turns the sport into an anaerobic sport, which makes it more exciting. Because it's not aerobic and aerobic like boxing or MMA, where you have your ups and downs and ups and this is uh and you can't keep up with it, you're done. You guys out and you get you know you get knocked out. Yeah. And fans get the best of it because it's exciting from beginning to end. I remember uh after my first fight, my sister is a fan, uh, a fight fan, right? And yeah. my sister tells me, my sister Adela tells me, Are you gonna watch the fights tonight? 
And it was like about a month or two months after my fight. And I was like, yeah, yeah, what time are you coming? I'm, like, I'm coming at this time. He says, you're going to miss the the, prelim, the prelims. And I'm like, yeah, hey, I, I just want to see the main card. And like, are you crazy? The prelims are <laughs> even better. And like, what you mean? And like, somebody always gets knocked out. <laughs> you know, like, she's all excited. <laughs> But it's true. Then I look at it like a fan instead of a fighter, right? You know. Yeah. And since then, when we watch Bare Knuckle, we don't miss one fight, man. Everything's exciting. Yeah. yeah. From start of, uh, to the end, but you've got a big fight announcement that got announced the other day against James Lilly at BKFC Forty Five. What's your thoughts on the fight and James Lilly as a fighter? Man, look. First off, before we get to James Lilly, I just like to clarify some things, and you get in it here in your show first because you're the first one to call me right uh i was scheduled to fight aspen trout yeah in june 16th right and i'm the champion yet i was called to fight him in his hometown yeah i'm the defending champion yeah so what does the real champion do said okay contract sign sent I said that was in New Mexico or something. It was in New Mexico. Yeah, yeah. I was supposed to be in New Mexico in Las Cruces, Las Cruces, New Mexico, in June 16. And for two months, I've been getting ready for nothing but softball. You know, this is a softball fight. It changes a complete dynamic of the fight, right? Yeah. The preparation, the training. Like, I pay for high level sparring partners. You know what I mean? That's yeah. all, I only spar. When I'm getting ready for a fight, I spar for 17 years every day. So now I only spar when I'm getting ready for a fight and specifically for that fighter. Yeah. So everything was based on a softball fighter. You know what I mean? The mid work, the back work, the, the sparring. And something happens out of my control with the venue from what I hear. This is the story that I hear. Something happened with the venue over there. And they changed the fight. They pushed it one week over to the June 23rd. And they changed the fight to Florida. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, thank God it happened the day before I was going to pay like a few thousand dollars for my camp because I was going to Colorado to train with uh, Justin Gagey. I was in, yeah. in elevation. So I was like, I was booking uh, Airbnb, car rental, you know, the payment of the gyms, the flights for my coaches and I. Like, it was money, bro. I was spending some serious money. And thank God. You know, I was there for Tyler's fight. And when I'm at Tyler's fight, the day before I was going to pay everything, you know, Dave Feldman tells me, hey, look, uh, the fight is going to be pushed over one week. And I'm like, what? What happened? And he tells me, look, we're changing the venue. We have some issues, blah, blah, blah. Long story short, it's going to be in Miami. Like, oh, thank God. I didn't have to pay all that shit I was going to pay. And, uh, you know, I was going to lose a lot of money, you know. So, all right, cool, cool. All right, bump. So, up uh, to then, it was still the same opponent. Apparently... Aston Trout gets the news and he hears that he no longer can have the fight in his home and he starts asking for more money. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm already gifting this guy a title shot. The only reason why I gifted him a title shot and I agreed to give him a fight after having only one fight in the organization is for two reasons. Number one, he's the highest level boxer ever signed to BKFC history. Two-time yeah. WBA world champion. He's fought the names that you can name. You know what I mean? Lara, you know, uh, Canelo. He, he yeah. knocked out or, or he, uh, what's his name? Uh, Miguel Cotto. You know, like, like he's fought the who's who's. You know what I mean? Great record still. I think, I believe he's still ranked like number six or something in, in the world, you know? So yeah. he, what have I been asking Dave Feldman for is the biggest asset. Dave, give me the biggest name possible. I want the biggest name possible for two reasons. Number one is it's going to be great for the organization. And number two, I want to fight the biggest name possible before, you know, it's all said and done for me. You know what I mean? I'm not, I'm no, I'm no sprung chicken, man. I'm 42 years old. You know what I mean? I understand that I'm running against time. I'm not saying that I'm feeling bad or slow or nothing like that. I feel good. But I want to take the most advantage of every year that I have left fighting an organization. You know what I mean? So yeah. I was aiming at the biggest name. And, and the MMA fighters are not doing it. Man. The MMA fighters are being pussies, brother. They're yeah. being, there's no other. I've been very respectful about things. But I'll give you an example. Chad Mendes. Chad Mendes was signed... 
he they gave him a walk a walk fight, you know, a, a fight to get his feet wet because when I called I him, fight you only after uh, that kid he fought in, the, in his debut. Can't remember his name. Yeah. Play him. I saw I told Dave, hey Dave, uh, what's up? You signed him, or are you fighting? And like, bro, you're the champion, you know, let him get his feet wet. The guy they got his feet wet, and then what he does, he runs for a whole year. I called him out three times publicly after each fight. A year out, comes back only to fight Eddie Alvarez. You know what I mean? So yeah. now you want to come and just fight whoever you want to fight. I'm giving you a title shot. So and then Eddie Alvarez. What, what you're in for? What you're in for? If you're not in it for a title, do you know what I mean? It's obviously just for the payday, isn't it? You understand what I'm saying, man? So, so yeah. just, Eddie Alvarez comes in and he just got signed, and there hasn't been a contract offered to him yet. But my name has came around, and 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 we've shared some words on on social media, and I'm like, yeah, you know, you know, we could fight one of these days. I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll throw the, the title shot at you quick because of your background, UFC, Bellator, former champion. Yeah. yeah. That speaks for itself, you know. So the dude is literally telling me like you and I were never fight for money. I'm like, what? So look, names like Eddie Alvarez, Chad Mendes, you're coming into my organization, right? Yeah. And you look for titles in the UFC, the biggest show in the world. You were a champion in the UFC, you were a champion in Bellator, second biggest show in the world. You come. Eddie Alvarez went to, to one FC and didn't become champion, but he was trying to. So now you come to bare knuckle, but you don't want to be a champion. What yeah. what is you don't believe you can be a champion? You know what I mean? So you want to get paid bucks, but you don't want to face the best. You, you, you know what I mean? So at, at this point, I'm already like, fuck, man. You know, like uh, you know, I, I wanted a big name, I wanted trial. So it was a to, to answer your question, man, and get back to James Lilly. To be very honest with you, without without counting him, you know, un, without underestimating him, you know what I mean? It was a turnoff. It was a turnoff in the sense that I was finally going to get a big name. Yeah. That, you know, to show the world the level of bare knuckle boxing today, which I am the representation of bare knuckle boxing today. You know what I mean? Or I'm one of them, you know? And I wanted to show the world what we can do to this you know, former UFC champions or, or UFC championship contenders or or world class former uh, glove boxing champions. Yeah, I wanted to show that and and show where bare knuckle stands. Because you hear all these people, there's people that that jump in the keyboard warriors talking about, oh, you know, this is where retired fighters go and isn't that like, bro, man, you have to have a certain sort of psych to be in this world. Some UFC, some MMA fighters, and I just put UFC, some MMA fighters and some professional boxers look at us like we're crazy. They won't, yeah. they won't take up the gloves. And then you got some that'll say, you know what, I'll do it. The Mike Perry's, the Eddie Alvarez, the Chad Mendes that came in. But they pick and choose. I challenged mm -hmm. Mike Perry like this. I haven't done it publicly. I challenged because, you know, Mike Perry's uh, uh, management, you know, we have little issues, you know, it's personal issues. You know, it's not nothing serious, but, you know, it's old, old stories. And... You know, they've gotten in the way of fights for me, you know. And he, you know, his, his, his manager, Malky, talks about the king of bare knuckles, Mike Perry. Look, man, I'm cool with Mike Perry. I was just with Mike Perry the other day in combat, in, in combat karate. You know, we, we, we're cool. Each other, we cool. We're both mutually respectful. We cool. We, we, we chill. You know, there's no beef. There's no animosity. Nothing like that. But when you come and talk about being the pound for pound or the best fighter or the king of an organization, you can't say that with two fights, bro. I don't no. care. It's two fights, man. I have I'm look, every fight that we take, I think like we as in my team, it's a new record setting. There's yeah. been one champion that has successfully defended his title more than three times. There hasn't been one guy that has reached eight and oh. Not one. You know, there's not one undefeated champion double champion in bare knuckle yeah. i've defended my title five times so i think i deserve those big names you know what i mean so it was a turn off now having that said right lily i don't underestimate the dude i think that he deserves a title shot because yeah, he had on the um show the other night and they said obviously he was mandatory or whatever it is with him being number one and um, he was meant to fight, you were meant to fight Austin Trout. And Lily said, I can't argue with that. 
He said he deserves it. He deserves a big name. He said, look at all the people have put in front of him. He's just went through him. It's about time he got a big shot on that. Do you know what I mean? So I think he he respects where you're coming from with that. Yeah, there's a lot of, of mutual respect between Lily and I, man. The guy's been nothing but respectful. And he's a warrior, man. I don't I don't count him out for nothing. You know, the dude, he, to, to reach a 7-0 record in bare-knuckle boxing, man, it, there's got to be something special to you. This is not a simple thing to do. You don't necessarily have to be the better fighter to win. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know what yeah. I mean? Like, like it's, shit happens. You can get a cut big enough. One punch, it? One punch, a job, a job can change the full fight. You know what I mean? That you can get knocked out and you just cut you. There's no gloves. You know, it could be a cut that was in the wrong place and you lost. You know yeah. what I mean? Those things. I did it. <laughs> so exactly. So 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 to be fair, you know, he literally does deserve a title shot. You know, and and when when they told me that the fight was off with this dude, I said, okay, well, fuck it. Then who's next? Uh, Lily. Okay, don't deal. Uh, contract, but we'll sign. Set. Done deal. Let's go. You know. Yeah. What 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 do you think of him of the fights that he's had so far? Obviously, with um your man Tyler Good John. What did you think of that fight? Man, to be very honest with you, and and this is like once again, you know, he's a very respectful guy and everything, but I'm very realistic. When it comes to judging a person for its work, you know, um, I've studied his record, his MMA record. Um, I've seen the way that he's lost. I've seen the people that he's fought. I've seen the people that he fought in boxing. I've seen the people that he fought in bare knuckle boxing. So let's just stick to to bare knuckle boxing, right? In bare knuckle boxing, I think there was about a total of four opponents that I don't even count them. You know, if you ask me, you know what I mean? Four opponents there with either losing records or debuting, like, you know, so out of seven fights, you know what I mean? Do the math, <laughs> you know? How many real fights do I see he has, you know? Now, when he fought Tyler Goodjob, he looked great. You know, he had a, he has a very good jab, um, very good uh, forward, you know, three, four punch combos, you know? But this is this is where this this sayings come to play. Where when you know when people say there's levels to this shit, you know? Yeah. And this is when it comes to play, right? It's once again kind of like like uh juggernaut, right? If you put juggernaut to fight the level fighters that I fought in his weight class, he wouldn't have all those knockouts. Or most likely he wouldn't even have all those wins. You see what I'm saying? Because yeah. it changes the dynamic of your performance. You know what I mean? So, like, if you give me right now, right? So, right now, I've been going through sparring partners, right? And, you know, I, I start paying when I find one that challenges me, you know? So, yeah. I go to sparring partners and I was like, okay, not this one, this one, not this one, you know? And it's like, if you're not putting me in danger in some sort of sense, yeah. I'm gonna a lot of shit to you. I'm yeah. going to angles I normally don't use. I'm going to throw more punches that I normally don't throw. You understand what I'm saying? Because yeah. presenting a danger to me. So I'm more loose and more open to do different things. You know, more yeah. variations of my style. When there's a serious threat in front of you, and you're also getting connected with precision, you're also missing, it changes everything. You know yeah. what I mean? When the That's when the dog in him and the dog in me is going to come out to see who has the bigger dog. That's that's the beauty about bare knuckle. Bare knuckle boxing, you can't hide behind skill for too long. Yeah. You know, with big gloves on, you can, you know, parry and block punches with the big gloves and absorb some of the punches with the gloves. Even though you're feeling it, you can absorb it better. You can open up. You know, you can go long. But bare knuckle boxing, my brother, you know, once that blah, blah, hits you, that pop, pop, pop really hits you or you go, ha, ha, you miss, miss, miss. You know, your confidence level starts to change. Your mind starts playing games. So that's when that dog, that animal instinct comes to, to life and it yeah. takes over and, and it comes out to once you pass that skill setting, it becomes a thing of who's the bigger dog. You know, I can do both. I can promise yeah. you that. Yeah. And do, does it sort of make the fight a little bit more exciting with him coming over from the UK to fight you? Yeah, it's cool, man. It's dope. It's dope. You know, it's, it's uh, I, I like my UK fans, man. I like my UK people. So, uh, you know, if you know, normally 
I'm a very respectful champion, man. You know, I respect everybody the same. Um, I, I think that that's part of the reason why when when I do beat people, uh, I earn their their fans' respect. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's, it's, it's more more fans for me. You know what I mean? Because I work <laughs> So I think it's a good thing, you know. It's uh, he deserves man. He deserves a title shot. We can, we can't say that he doesn't, you know. And if the right offer ever come along, would you ever take a fight over in the UK? Oh man, a, a thousand percent. I would love to fight more outdoors, you know. Yeah. Uh, but it's all gonna come down to this, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm, in position, I'm in a position in my life right now where, look, at first when I first would talk and have these meetings with uh, Dave Feldman, I would tell him, man, my legacy. Everything's everything was about my legacy, you know, and I already became the first two way division champion, the first two way division champion undefeated, the first pound for pound, you name it. I already broke all these things. I already wrote my history. I already, I already, I think I already stapled my 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 legacy. You know, it's gonna be a little hard for somebody to break what I've done so far. You know, um, especially with all the raw talent coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, so at this point, man, for me, when every time that I get asked about the next fight i don't care the name i don't care the place i care the number that comes attached to that name in place <laughs> yeah i don't care who it is where it is and i don't even care what weight class it is all <laughs> i care is what is the number in the end of that equation that's all i care about and then we can talk you know 100 yeah, percent. and are you still currently the 165 pound champion or have you vacated that belt now no no i have not vacated i'm not vacated the belt no um i it's asked, hard, isn't it, to jump up and down weights and keep defending it must be must be hard look man uh, I'll, I'll be very honest with you man i'm not i'm not trying to stay at 165 you know what i mean it's yeah. not uh it's not my natural weight class i i don't even get heavier than 175 yeah <laughs> Like, you know, like I'm giving a lot of advantage. The only reason why I'm doing it was because I'm looking for a bigger check yeah. and looking to do something nobody had done yet. You know what I mean? But uh, I don't plan on staying there. I would like, I would, if, if if it was a perfect world, what I wanted to do was defend it against Trout that debuted at 165. Yeah. And then I probably would have just let that belt go and yeah. focus on 155 for the rest of my fighting time, you know? And at this point, what I want to do is I want to defend. I think that once I defend the 155 pound title against James Lady for the sixth time, I think that that gives me enough respect and room to sit out at a 155 for a little bit. If they want to do an interim title for somebody else, let it be. Yeah. And allow me to defend my 165 pound title against Eddie Alvarez. That's what I'm aiming at. And that's what you will hear after the fight. After I beat this fight, Eddie Alvarez has to come out of the woodworks and he has to give me that fight at 165. We'll have to, you know, give him the title shot. And 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 I'll tell you very honestly, man, more important to me at this point, because all of these fighters that are coming in, they're hiding behind the fact that I'm a champion. <laughs> I, I, I cut onto it with Chad already. They hide behind the fact that I'm a champion. They have to do a fight before getting to me or two yeah. fights. And they're trying to get the checks without facing me. So if I have to relinquish the belt... You know, to fight this dude, I have no problem doing that. You know what I mean? As long as I'm going to get paid with a big name. That's what I care about, you know? Yeah, if, it, if you ended up calling Eddie Alvarez out on the mic and obviously he's wanting to stay in the BKFC, he could not turn it down, could he? Everyone would be like, what the fuck? <laughs> well, it, Chad Mendes did for a whole year. I'm, I'm hoping they're not the same. You know what well, I mean? Have you, have you been watching much of the... Um, I'm just wondering if we could get a bit of your opinion on the BKFC UK and how uh, the guys over here were doing the work with them shows. Have you been watching much of the BKFC UK? Yeah. Oh, it looks dope, man. It looks good. I like it. I like it. There's some of them that come out with some, some real dog in them, you know? It's, man, yeah. man, no, man I, I've been paying attention to the, to the shows in Thailand, in the UK, you know, the shows that we're doing in the States. And yeah. It's growing, man. It's growing. It's growing. It's the new thing, you know. And it's it's here to stay. It's it's growing really fast. And you know, yeah, I, I would I would actually I would have loved to be there, been there for for Tyler, man, when he fought over there. But yeah, I have a, a, a Peruvian passport that that passport can go through straight. But because of the damn COVID situation, I couldn't go. I had to get like a special 
a visa because of the COVID thing and, and I couldn't get it on time. So I love to, even if I don't, if I don't go to fight anytime soon, I love to go and watch a, a show in person. So yeah, I, I definitely love to do that. It'd be great to have you over, mate. But I'll ask a uh, last question, mate. What can we ex expect to see from Louis Palomino at BKFC 45? Let's say in the words of the great Chris Lido, you will witness yet again another masterful performance ending with a chaotic, crazy knockout. Because I will get that knockout on James Lilly. James Lilly tends to overthrow himself on punches because he's tapping and going. And he does have a, a lot of belief in his chin because he's proven to have a very good chin. But the level of the fighters have been hitting him clean. There's levels to this shit. When I hit him clean, it's going to be lights out on lights out, Liddy. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet, mate. And before we wrap it up, mate, is there any, anything else you want to share with us or any sponsors, shout outs, anything yeah. you like? A big, big, big thank you to my sponsors, man. Uh, Florida Yachts International, uh, Cigarette Racing, First Step, uh, First Step Realty, Hollywood Golden, uh, Hollywood Golden uh, Diamonds, uh, Sativa. That's my clinic. You know, they have my. That's where I do my IVs, my recovery, like everything that has to do with with recovering from massages to to uh, hyperbaric chambers and all that stuff. All the good stuff, you know, that keeps a a, a, a man fit. Um, I just have so many sponsors, man. I just want to miss them. Stigway mm -hmm. Racing, um, Divino Ceviche. If you're ever here in Miami, man, you got to taste this food, man. It's Peruvian food at its finest. Divino nice. Ceviche, different type of restaurant. Divino Ceviche, Ceviche by Divino, and Ataco by Divino. So it's like a Japanese infused Peruvian food, a Mexican infused Peruvian food, and the Peruvian original food is nice. delicious, it's out of control. Um, and uh, everybody else that supports me, man, that I missed out 1 800 injured. Um, Hollywood Golden Diamond. I mentioned it. It's white meat. It's sharp. It gives me sharp. What was that? Uh, Bunnell Marine, Bunnell Marine, and uh, Sativa. So yeah, thank you, my brother, for having me, man. It's been a pleasure. Um, and oh, of course, the Young Tigers Foundation, my gym. That's where that's where we train at. Where everybody's training at. We'll talk about it later. Uh, just a new uh, management company, servicing, and the name is Primal Instinct Management led by yours truly and everybody is like flooding in right now so when i have everything more concrete we'll talk about it again man young tigers foundation the workout spot those are my gyms you know thank you for having me brother appreciate it not a problem mate really appreciate you coming on louis and i hope you enjoy the rest of your day pal awesome brother you too man take care take care man